I think this is a really topical discussion and a real timely one as well, actually, and very relevant to the National Apprenticeships Week's theme around looking beyond. And also, I think, from the Department of Education who are interested in hearing more about how our employers are measuring the impact of apprenticeships nationally. And also, they've said to us recently, they're keen to receive feedback on how people are sharing best practice. So I think it's really timely and very, very important. In the main, we're going to focus on degree apprenticeships and the levy in England. However, I think the discussion and the elements of learning that we get from today are applicable across all levels and across all the four nations of the UK and beyond. So it's my pleasure to welcome this uh, expert panel of learning and development professionals today to have the discussion. And I'll hand over to Martin Cousins, who's going to chair today and uh, begin the session. So over to you, Martin. Thank you, Viren. Um, I'm Martin Cousins. I'm a journalist in the corporate learning space, and I'm going to be your guide through this webinar. Um, we're here to discuss the impact of apprenticeships in the workplace, and we'll be delving into four specific areas to do that. This will be followed by a short Q&A. So our four areas, they are, one, measuring the impact on individual apprentices, then we're going to look at how to measure the impact of apprenticeship programmes on the business, how apprenticeships can help diversify the workforce, and demonstrating the value of apprenticeship programmes. And we'll be referring to some questions that we've pulled together to go into each of those four areas. Um, so, on to our panel. Um, I'd, I'll let each one of you introduce yourselves, if that's OK. So, Sarah, should we start with you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, hi everyone, I'm Sarah Farley. Uh, I work at Unilever. Um, so I actually started my career um, in the hair and beauty sector um, with an apprenticeship. Um, and then I had a change of heart and um, moved, uh, moved into Unilever. I did a level three business administration apprenticeship programme with Unilever. Um, and after completing that in September 2018, I moved into our future careers team, um, which is where I work now, uh, supporting our population of apprentices graduates and uh, placements as well. Hi, I'm Lucy Hunt, I'm National Programme Manager for Apprenticeships at Health Education England and HEE are essentially support the NHS with all aspects of apprenticeship implementation and development um, and sustainability. So yeah, huge job, but um, it's going well. Hi, good morning. My name is Viren Patel. I'm the Director of the Business Development Unit within the Open University and my role is to work with all employers around their learning and development requirements, whether it's our core product or whether it's apprenticeship programmes. Hi, <coughs> I'm Kate Kelly. I f I'm from Public Health England. I'm the Learning and Development Manager in Public Health England responsible for our um, running our apprenticeship scheme, um, which currently covers uh, 5,500 staff, and we utilise about 36 different apprenticeship standards. Um, so yes, it's quite a big scheme um, because we're such a varied and diverse uh, workforce. There's lots and lots of uh, apprenticeship programmes that we can um, take advantage of. Thank you. Morning everyone, my name is Anne Ashworth and I'm Head of Employee Apprenticeships at Pearson PLC. Um, I'm a former apprentice of too many years ago to actually even comment on. Um, and I've been involved in this sector for, again, far too many years to even think about. Um, but we in Pearson have been running our own programme for many years, but once we got into the levy, it really took shape. So we've got about 130 apprentices on programme from level three up to level seven. Uh, we work with numerous providers and, and the OU has been one of our key strategic partners with our programme. Good morning, everybody. I'm Dave Oxley and I'm the Apprenticeship Programme Manager for DHL UK and Ireland. And we manage apprenticeships over 19 different areas, ranging from level two right up to level seven. And the number we've got in, in excess of 500 live apprentices at the minute. So really, a really diverse programme. So, yeah, very, very interesting role. Thank you. Thank you to our panel. A very wide and diverse and deep experience, then, of apprenticeships, which is fantastic. So our first topic of conversation today is looking at measuring the impact of ind on individual apprentices. And my first question goes to Sarah, who has actually done more than one apprenticeship, it turns out. Um, Sarah, do you feel you'd be in the same position you're in now at Unilever if you hadn't done an apprenticeship with them? Um, absolutely not. So I, I think what's, what's one of the big challenges um, today is that there, there's a huge pressure on 
young people and well, of all ages really to, to kind of make decisions on what career they want to do for the rest of their lives and I think what what's really been impactful for me in the apprenticeship space has been actually having the opportunity to do multiple different kind of career pathways um, and learning and, and earning at the same time and kind of having the flexibility to be able to to kind of try things out and, and understand actually what you want to do and, and, and kind of what drives you and, and what meets your purpose and, and things like that. So I, I definitely don't think I would be in the position that I am now if I hadn't done um, both of my apprenticeships actually. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the really powerful things, particularly at Unilever, has been the kind of the coaching, the mentoring, um, as well as the, the kind of qualification that you're working towards but it's the, it's the level of support that you get whilst you're on an apprenticeship as well um, and it's that that experience that's fundamental to success as well great now within the within the apprenticeship programs there's the 20 percent off the job requirement um, Kate can I just bring you in on this uh, at public health England you're seeing some the value in that could you just um, explain some of the benefits you've seen um, yes, yeah, so, so we kind of um, approached the 20% um, off the job right at the beginning um, with all of our line managers and with our apprentices. Um, and we, we kind of give a bit of guidance in that, you know, it, it's not one day a week, which can be a massive barrier um, to um, line managers letting their staff undertake an apprenticeship or even bringing somebody in because they'll say, well, I'm only going to have them for four days a week. Um, <clears throat> so we say to them, Look, you know, this apprenticeship programme is for X amount of time. It might be two years, it might be three or four years. And actually, in somebody's career, that's a really short period of time when you look at the bigger picture. So what, what we do is we, we sit down with our line managers, we encourage our line managers to sit down with their staff, look at the, the standard um, <clears throat> as it's been written and all the contents, the skills, the knowledge and the behaviours within that standard. And then um, look at the role of that individual and where they can undertake or uh, evidence during their learning things that are within the standard. Um, and then when they do their off the job or they do their learning, what can they bring back in to their job as they're working through the, the life cycle of their apprenticeship? And what we're finding is that where they are bringing that learning back into the workplace directly and evidencing it through evidence that evidencing that learning through their day job actually they're building their capability and they're building their capacity and as soon as you can start seeing that and you can start to measure that it's a really really good selling point for that 20 percent off the job because it's not we all know it's not one day a week out of the office so so those are some of the benefits that we're, we're seeing around how we we work that 20 percent back into the day job itself can I just pick up on that? You said that then you can start to measure that yeah. impact. So how, how, do you, how are you starting to do that? Um, we, we, know that we, we, you know, we know that through uh, staff one-to-ones, um, through our appraisal systems, that as people are um, moving along through their career with their apprenticeship, that um, their capability is building and that their capacity is building as well. And they're able to take on uh, work from other members of the team and start to be able to support other members of the team. Um, so we're finding that, you know, s some line managers will say, well, if I put my if I put my staff on an apprenticeship, what's the backfill going to be for that one day a week? And they're not asking those questions anymore because they they can see through evidence, staff stories, and all these kind of things that we build in, and we do a lot of work on the intranet, just selling across a very vast organisation how that 20% is actually increasing that capacity and capability. And can I just add, I think, I was just hearing a story this morning around one of the learners who had the 20% off the job as a requirement for her apprenticeship. But actually she saved the, month, the, the company, I think it was about 30 or 40,000 pounds over that period of time. So that, there is tangible value from having that off the job yeah. aspect of it, because you get to think, you get thinking time, which actually then has the benefit to the organisation in tangible terms, potentially, yeah. through any efficiencies or through just strategic direction or through whatever they choose. I think also, if I could just add, there's, there's an important piece as well where the employer can have a proactive part in, in deciding what that off-job looks like, and it can really provide some intrinsic benefits which add some real value, and it makes the apprenticeship real-time, and, and it links the two off-job and the vocational piece, dovetails very succinctly in what they're doing. 
Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, we get 20% off the job as a barrier, especially in terms of clinical areas. I can't afford to be losing them one day a week. Yeah. But if you're working with a good provider, that can actually, it's, you know, it doesn't equate to that and can be really beneficial for the yeah. employer and the apprentice. Yeah. Okay, so Dave, you talked about those intrinsic benefits. What are those? What, what, have you got some examples of those? Uh, yeah, so we, we develop our leaders, you know, internally, and we have some very good internal um, development programs. So it's linking those development programs with the degree level program. And, you know, it's, it's tying it all together, and it's very, very neat, succinct, and it gives you a consistent approach to develop the leaders, which we're doing now in our business. Yeah. Great. So, Anne, at Pearson, um, how are you measuring the impacts of apprenticeships of ex existing staff over periods of time? Because we're, we're sort of starting to touch on this here. So how, how does that work for you? Yeah, I mean, if you're in a lucky position where you can start to think about what it is you want to measure at the very beginning um, and then get that into the company systems, then that, that's the perfect scenario. But I think for most of us, you've got the company systems you have to work with or work around. Uh, <clears throat> so what we have um, got are systems that, that will give us information. And we're now in a position where we can start to do some trends analysis because we've been doing this a little while and the levy's been in so that we can actually sort of measure things. And I think the first thing really is looking at the knowledge, skills and behaviour that apprentices get, rather, regardless of whether they're existing staff or new. And where are they at the end of the apprenticeship? And then where are they when it comes to performance review for the following year and ongoing? And that in turn links to things like promotion, um, speed of promotion, um, their movement around the business. We're already seeing a number of our apprentices are getting promoted, almost being headhunted by other parts of the business because they've heard how good the programmes are. Um, and we're seeing that also in terms of salary increases as well. So we're beginning to, to build up some data that's really going to give us some interesting information. One of the key things for me, though, is actually the apprentice experience, you know, because that links back to employee engagement. Um, and we have something internally called efficacy. So we've got an efficacy review of our program going on at the moment, and that totally focuses on our apprentices almost being customers and are they getting the good deal that I said they would do and hold me to account for it? Um, and that, that's really important. So, you know, we, we do uh, lots of surveys. We hold, employer, we hold employee forums. I run something called a time to talk where I come up with mad ideas and the apprentices tell me that I'm really ridiculous or actually they like the ideas. Um, all of that, that whole range of information, some of it is very much what we do as a normal part of business and other things we've added through the apprenticeship but enhance what the business does so you know you've got the best of both worlds there and it will continue to develop and what are you so you, this efficacy review mm -hmm. could you just expand a little bit more on that because that uh, what and, and what happens with that yeah. data well, it's an, it's an internal process that uses any external data and research as a benchmark to start with. So the OU's report last year, for example, is part of that research data. Um, and then they've interviewed um, a sample of the apprentices, the line managers, and other stakeholders within the business, but also some of our providers. So it ranges across all of our apprenticeship programmes, and it will also cover all age ranges, all grade profiles. Um, and the idea is to really pull together a feeling as to, again, some certain criteria as to whether we as a business are getting a good return on the investment. You know, ultimately, that's what it is. But it is also that employee engagement that's a big part of it. So our return on investment is, are our employees getting something out of this programme that they wouldn't have got in another way in Pearson? And we've had the first um, interim report back, and I have to say it's positive. Um, I think there's, there's been a little bit of, well, there's been some feedback, actually, on um, the way that our line managers are engaging. Um, I, it's, it, you know, it's in pockets, and I think most of our providers would say that. So we've definitely got to do some more work there. But we know that's an area that always needs constant work. 
However, the 20% is being met, over being met, which is good, and our apprentices are exceptionally positive about what they're getting. And for me, the key driver actually has been of those apprentices have achieved, 97% have got distinctions on their apprenticeships, which is significantly higher than the national average at this time. So that shows that they've enjoyed it and they've really challenged themselves. And I think that says a lot about an individual on a programme that you know, requires a lot from them. Great. So, so picking up on what we do with these successes, Viren, the OU has taken on apprentices and I gather you have a couple just finishing their chartered manager degree apprenticeship. So do you think their story would inspire others within the OU to hire an apprentice? Yep, and I think the answer to that is they already have actually. So we started our apprenticeship journey um, internally within the OU about two and a half years ago with, with, with Alex and Dan. We're now at 33, which is a fraction of, of, of the apprenticeships of, of my colleagues on this, on this panel, but it's a step in the right direction. And um, there are various programmes, all the way from plumbing to senior leader, so various programmes. And I think we've got now a programme of activity that um, we're promoting apprenticeships internally within the OU. I get constant, I get requests for, from managers to say, well, how do I get an apprentice? How do I get an Alex and Dan as part of our team? So we're getting that, that message out there. And, you know, Alex and Dan are great ambassadors for us internally within the OU, but also externally as well. So we're seeing that already. Um, and we're seeing that journey. And we're, we're becoming a lot more, um, um, I suppose, a lot more organised around that approach. Yeah. And would anyone else like to comment on how the, that apprentice experience is being used to inspire others in the business? I could just add a comment to that. We're, we're using our chartered managers to go out and to visit schools and colleges um, and deliver lectures to would-be apprentices, uh, sharing their stories and the really positive aspects that they're picking up from doing the apprenticeship, but also earning a living whilst doing the job. And, you know, it's picking some really good positive feedback up from the schools and colleges that we visited. And also it's giving the apprentices on our programmes the confidence to sort of do more things and get out there and share that success story. Um, if I could just chip in, we've got um, three apprentices that are part of the Young Apprentice Ambassador Network. So they represent the apprentices in their local region. And then we've also got two that are on the National Leadership um, council for the National Society of Apprentices. So they're actually having a voice in policy decisions at UK level and working with apprentices across Europe and the world. Um, that's an amazing experience for them and they bring that back into the business and then they inspire other apprentices who then want to take over that mantle when they hand back. So it's that external value added that they get as well as within the business. Um, we've got some great examples where we might have senior leaders in an NHS trust doing the level seven senior leader and suddenly that enthusiasm for apprenticeships cascades down um, and they go to other departments and say, hey, why are you not doing an apprenticeship? You know, so I think there are a lot of positive stories out there. Definitely. And I think from from my own personal experience as well, um, the, the kind of opportunities that you get as an apprentice, I think in most organisations, to be able to, to kind of go out to school. So um, I was part of our what we call our apprentice influencer um, community. Um, so I went out to schools, I presented at open evenings um, and it's all things like that that's kind of led me to supporting with, with events like this really um, to kind of build up confidence um, as well as kind of shouting about how incredible being an apprentice is. Lucy, can I just quickly come back on the, the leadership and how that's cascaded? Now, is that a kind of formal process or is that just emerged within the organisation? How's that worked? So one of the challenges we've got is everyone thinks the NHS is one big organisation, but I work with 263 very different trusts. So we've got some examples, great examples of where, yep, you've got a fully engaged senior leadership team, they're all doing apprenticeships, they're cascading it down, going to their finance managers, going to HR, because again, you know, in terms of NHS, yes, we've got huge clinical roles, but we've also got massive back offices and it's just making sure that they can embrace the full opportunity that apprenticeships offer and maximise spending their levy. But yes, we do. We are encouraging trust to make sure that they have got a clear embedded strategy where they can fully utilise their individual levies and make sure that they are maximising all the opportunities. And just, um, I want to come back to Sarah. Do you think your, do you think that all apprentices are in a good position to do the sorts of things that you've been doing? Because you're really banging the drum. For in terms of kind of the opportunities? Yes, and inspiring yeah. others. Yeah, so I think that, I mean, I think 
in terms of kind of what's available on a national level, the fact that we have National Apprenticeship Week, I think is incredible um, to kind of give give apprentices the voice to um, to kind of shout about the fact that, that they're apprentices, what they're learning, um, the skills that they're developing, the opportunities that they're getting. Um, I definitely think it's something that, that every apprentice has the opportunity to get involved in. Um, I mean, it's it, I think what's so great about it is that nothing is mandatory. Um, it, it's very much there's you can get involved in as much or as little as you want to um, and I think that's that's kind of what gives empowers people to to want to kind of bang drum. Yeah. Great. I think Thanks. it's interesting the stigma around apprenticeships the history behind that has now moved away we're moving into a different place now so apprenticeships are seen as a development tool um, the levy being introduced has, has given that that a bit more momentum and I think we're slowly seeing a change in people's perceptions of apprenticeships in the workplace and it's not, you know, not for, for sort of low level, low level skills jobs. It's actually across the whole piece of your your um, organisation. And you know, I think apprentices are a great story that bring to life what these guys are actually doing on a day to day basis and the value they're adding. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. So we're going to move on to our second topic for today, and that's how to measure the impact of apprenticeship programmes on the business. So. I'm going to start with you, Dave, DHL. How has your apprenticeship programme worked operationally, given that most of your apprentices will be working on contracts? Well, operationally, they've been across our business. Um, they've been across the business uh, range and across our customer um, portfolio. But what we've tried to do is deliver a consistent approach uh, to these different uh, business areas, making sure that what these individuals are learning is the same because they will be expected to transfer around our business uh, and as part of that program there is a placement move midway through the program so it is really key that we get that consistent approach and the curriculum that we've developed with the OU is giving us that and going back to the off job learning piece which we touched on previously again it's allowing us to have the input in that curriculum to make sure that that is really fit for purpose and it is transferable. Yeah. And how many people are you working with? At any one time across the business on the on the chartered manager yeah. yeah we've currently got 17 individuals on our central cohort but we've also got individuals as well within the business or existing colleagues who are doing the chartered manager and the senior leader yeah and how and how are you looking at the impact of those programs well we're measuring these impacts through personal development reviews we've talked about okay. feedback and performance and it aligns with our future leaders program because all the individuals on this program are designed to be on the programme to develop into future leaders. So there is a pathway and a development programme that they must follow, really, that yeah. you know it needs to be measured, it needs to be performance measured against the set criteria, and also achieving the business targets of the areas where they're working in. Yeah, great. So Lucy, um, Health Education England, have you seen an impact on the business where apprentices have been able to put into practice what they're learning? Yes, 100%. Um, we are getting lots of really positive feedback, certainly um, in terms of nursing, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, these new degree apprenticeships where feedback from employers um, and um, the apprentices themselves is that they are head and shoulders above our traditional students from that route because of the design and the way the apprenticeship is delivered they are actually getting the opportunity to go back into the workplace, hone those skills, put into practice what they're learning um, and we're really seeing the benefits of that and we've had some really great examples and case studies um, and feedback from employers um, of really how would they are setting the bar um, you know in terms of nursing traditionally um, you know you'd have that student but they wouldn't have a placement until quite far into the course quite often they can be a rabbit in the headlights but no these apprentices are just rolling up their sleeves and getting in of it because they've got that confidence so it's really really positive for us and is there particular data that you use to support to, to, to show that impact? Um, it's early days, but yeah, that is certainly something that we are going to be capturing so that, again, when we can go to trusts that are that not necessarily implementing or utilising degree apprenticeships to be able to show, you know, in terms of retention and increases in, in you know, key areas, we think that's going to be really powerful. Yeah. Okay. So, Anne, I mean, one area of impact would be productivity. Um, is that something that Pearson is able to quantify? Yeah, um, I mean, we've, we've got quite small teams in and around Pearson, and as you can imagine, we're quite diverse. We go from schools all the way through to higher ed to international content as well. Um, and one of the things that, that we're picking up is that those teams have all got set KPIs they have to meet, 
they are meeting them, even with, if you like, the 20% that's coming away from a, an apprentice, and in some cases are exceeding them, because the apprentice is bringing back efficiencies, um, new ways of thinking, new ways of working, as a direct result of the learning they're getting from their apprenticeship. We've had some apprentices that have won national professional awards, and their manager too, on the back of being an apprentice, so not an apprentice award, a professional award for the job that they do. Um, we've seen more effective management practice, which is, you know, absolutely critical to a business like ours, where, you know, you can actually physically see differences and the senior managers are able to quantify that in the way that the managers interact within internal meetings, but also with customers and external facing. Um, the KPIs that our providers put within the apprenticeships are really important because we work closely with them to make sure they're aligned to the KPIs for that individual apprentice, but also the ones for the team as well. So that when they come to do the performance review, it can be aligned to the review that happens in the apprenticeship. So the apprenticeship is absolutely critical to, as Dave said, the performance review of that apprentice as an individual employee within the business. And that gives us some really good measurable data um, from a central team's perspective, but also as line managers, so that they can actually give them the rewards and the bonuses, etc., that they are absolutely due. Uh, and we're definitely seeing the quality of work from those individuals that do apprenticeships is far, far better than those that don't. And this, would anyone else on the panel like to comment on that? Because they, these these are really hard uh, metrics, aren't they? These are mm -hmm. business metrics that you are measuring your apprentices mm -hmm. and the programmes against. Is there anyone else? I'd like to comment just saying, you know, the energy we've seen from the young people on the apprenticeships is really invigorating. Um, and also, it, it does, the, the projects that they're involved in, it just gives that energy to move them forward. And there's been some, you know, not surprises, but really looking at these young individuals, how they're developing quickly within this area and picking up the mantle mm -hmm. and moving things forward, uh, you know, which a few years ago you would have never imagined individuals coming in, working in a vocational role and studying a degree, you know, doing that. But the appetite and the development we've seen and the confidence in such a, such a short space to move these people on just shows how good this pipeline of development can be. Yeah. I think, you know, I think from our perspective, we now have seven apprentices in my team and they bring a lot of energy, but also they bring a different point of view. And actually makes us think as an organization what we should be doing differently. So there's a few of them in the audience today. Um, and they bring a, they question things. They don't have a simple mindset of, of this is how we've done it before. They don't have any idea. So they actually, by questioning, they're making us question and think about how we should be changing things and making things more better. So yeah. I think that is an absolute benefit and tangible benefit of, of having apprentices within the organization. Now we're gonna come on to um the whole issue of diversifying the workforce um, shortly. So I'll, I'll come back to the impact of the apprenticeship programmes. Um, Viren, what about retention? Um, do you think taking on apprenticeships impacts on retention? Yeah, I, I think it does actually. I think it, you know, it does increase staff loyalty. I think from an apprentice's point of view that that organisation is invested in that individual. So they feel like they owe that organisation something in return. So I think there is an element of loyalty within it. It's encouraging to hear from the panel that there's rotation and people wanting to, and other organisations or other people within the organisation wanting to poach those apprentices that gives that value. So, you know, they, they are actively managing their career. They want, they're ambitious. They want to career progress. They want to move forward. And I think that creates loyalty, that creates retention, and that, that can only be a good thing. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, I think we're, we're still waiting for some solid metrics on it, but we know that retention in the NHS is a huge area. But if now you can offer a, a potential apprentice a pathway from level two up to level seven, we've mapped that out. That could actually mean they're with you for 10 years. So that's a win by anyone's um, book. And then in terms of actually just spreading that word and cascading, as they're, if they've come through the apprenticeship route, they then become a manager, they're then supportive of apprentices in their areas. So you just need those internal ambassadors to make your programmes work. Yeah. I think you've also made a good point about mapping the different levels of apprenticeship. I think moving people through, utilising level three, level five, level seven, whatever the journey looks like, makes that journey realistic and gives them actual time to take on the learning and then put that to some good use in a real role while they're still learning. And then when they do choose to make their next step, they're really ready for that next development step. You know, it's, it's meaningful and it's not just about just going through the numbers. They've got the experience to back that progression up. 
and that's where we will see the, the benefit as businesses and ultimately get more experienced individuals leading at a younger age. Yeah, it's exactly um, the, the sort of thing that we've done in, in, in PHE is look at the different kind of career um, careers that there are across the organisation. So as I said you know, at the beginning, we are very diverse. So we have sort of 50% scientists and 50% non-scientists. And we have you know, data analysts, we have HR, we have pensions. Um, we've got so many different um, occupations across um, PHE. So we've looked at each of those different occupations that we've got and, and mapped a potential career. So somebody coming in right at entry level all the way through up, up to level seven, be that in scientific or, or non-scientific. Um, at all people that, that want to start in the middle somewhere because they need, maybe they need some leadership and, and management development. And it's not just about a career in science, it's also where can we add some other things into that? Do they need to move into bioinformatics? Do they need to move into data? Do they need some leadership management qualifications along the way? So you can, um, as Lucy was saying, you know, you can literally map out sort of 10 even longer um, career for somebody. And that's great for somebody coming in who can see that map and they want to come and work for you because they can see where their career can potentially go. So the reality for you there is that that retention is happening because of that, those pathways. Yeah, de definitely. I mean, I, I think um, I literally pulled some data on it the other day. I think we've got about 80% retention of our um, apprentices uh, within the organisation. Um, and that's what I... That's, where I have um, new staff coming in to do an apprenticeship. About 80% of those will stay with us. And all of those apprentices have come in on an entry-level grade and they are, they are now on the next grade, or some of them are even on two grades higher up than where they came into the organisation. So, yeah, and that, that we're retaining them because yeah. we're investing in them, so yeah. they're giving back to the organisation and they want to stay with us. Yeah. So retention's a powerful indicator. Um, so, Sarah, what's, in terms of impact of apprenticeship programs at Unilever what, what what work are you doing there um so we've been we've been on a on a long journey actually um so we have had our kind of school leaver um, apprenticeships um that have been in place for a, for a long time now um and we've we've kind of over the last sort of year and a half or so we've been um uh, enabling uh, existing employees to do apprenticeships as well. So it's kind of two two separate journeys, really. Um, I think from a, from a kind of our sort of new starter apprentices, what's been uh, really amazing from an impact perspective uh, in that sense is actually giving the apprentices the opportunity to shout about what they're achieving. Um, so we have actually, um, two years in a row now, we've run uh, an internal Unilever Apprentice of the Year um, awards. And that's been a really nice opportunity to, to kind of give the apprentices themselves to, to sort of talk about, you know, what, what have they achieved, how they actually helped the business to grow. Um, and then being able to kind of put those examples in front of some of our senior leaders. Um, and then you see how excited they get about it as well. And it kind of just builds this energy around the whole concept of an apprenticeship and having an apprentice in your team and, and kind of what they can what they can bring to the bring to the table, really. So that's really exciting. But then I think from a, an existing employee perspective, perspective. What's really exciting in that space is that, as I'm sure in, in many other organisations, uh, kind of learning budgets have always been very stretched. And so I think actually this is where the kind of introduction of the apprenticeship levy brings a lot of excitement because all of a sudden you have this much larger budget than, than you previously did. So being able to give existing employees the opportunity to, to kind of spend a year or two years working towards a qualification that they're really excited about is like we're seeing a lot of excitement and a lot of conversation. Um, so I think when you kind of group the two separate conversations together, um, th there's a lot of excitement. Yeah, I just agree in terms of, you know, that's a really good point in terms of actually the opportunity of the levy. The NHS have got a combined levy spend of over £200 million. Um, and, you know, in times where budgets are being cut, to actually have that ring fence to be spent purely on training and development is a really great opportunity. Um, can I add to that, Lucy? Yeah. yeah. The, the, um, when we talk about our career maps, what we also do is we will go to um, teams where we are promoting um, apprenticeships as a really good learning and development tool so, and say to them, if you were to take this individual and you wanted to retain them for 10 years and you wanted to put them through this pathway, this is what it's going to cost you. But it's not going to cost you anything because you can do exactly the same thing through the levy. So I'm saving your local budget 25, 27 40, 50,000 pounds over the lifetime of a career development opportunity for somebody because it's going to be paid from the levy. 
and that tends to get buy-in. And are there, other, are there, just finally, any other impact measurements on apprenticeship programmes that you're using that you haven't already I think there's discussed. an attraction piece there as well. So as a result of having apprentices within your organisation, you do attract a better quality of applicant to your organisation as a result of that because they see the pathway, they see the journey those apprentices have been on. So I feel, you know, in the apprenticeship space and actually in the non-apprentice space because they've seen that you're investing in your individuals and your staff. So they, you see that attraction piece, so you see a better quality, I feel a better quality of individual coming to, to work for you. I think also it's, it's about interacting with the younger the younger person uh, in our emerging talent team, which the apprenticeship team is part of. We've had a, a graduate programme running for quite a number of years and there may have been a, a view that our graduate numbers may have been reduced due to the degree level apprenticeship, but they've not. The, you know, the short answer to that is it's not affected it. They've gone up for our intake, but what it's given us as a business is another pipeline where we can develop younger people along our future leaders uh, journey. Uh, and, and it's people that we probably wouldn't have interacted with before that pipeline existed because they would have probably gone into a vocational role or took the traditional route down into the university. So it has opened that, that door for us to sort of really interact with that uh, younger person and develop them as leaders, which is really impactful on us as a business. Yeah. And I think that, that leads us very nicely into the third um, area of conversation for today, which is how apprenticeships can help diversify the workforce. Now, Viren, we've already, you already picked up on this. Um, and my first question is to both Dave and Sarah, so I'll, I'll let you fight over who answers first. <laughs> but the, um, you both offer apprenticeship programmes um, to school leavers at degree level. So do you feel this has given people an opportunity to study a degree where otherwise they wouldn't have done? Yeah. <laughs> um, so this this is really exciting um, for me. I think from a from a degree perspective, I think um, we, we've kind of gone on a journey from kind of going from a very traditional university structure in the UK to actually moving into this degree apprenticeship space. Which I mean, both both are fantastic. Um, but what I've seen in my experience, so at Unilever, we've got uh, at the moment we've got about seventy yeah, about seventy degree apprentices on program. Um, and I think what's really interesting is is the diversity that we have in that. So we have um, we have an example of um, apprentices who have uh, who have uh, kind of come out of the workplace. They've gone and, and had children, um, and then they've almost used our apprenticeship program as like a return to work. Um, so it is kind of giving them the opportunity to learn the skills study towards a degree um, that, that they may not have had the opportunity to have done uh, outside of that. I think the other thing that's really exciting as well is that we have a lot of our apprentices, as we've mentioned a little bit earlier, around kind of apprentices who might come in on a level three program and then they progress through the different levels onto a degree level. And um, a lot of them may not have even considered doing a degree until they had the opportunity of experiencing an apprenticeship. And then they start to consider, actually, I'm really enjoying the learning and getting and experience at the same time and then they, it kind of extends what they think they're capable of um, and I think that's really exciting and I think the other the other part around um, kind of attraction as well is that you there, there's always going to be a population of, of individuals who want to go to university whatever way they do it and so we capture a lot of, of those individuals who obviously like the idea of not having to pay their university fees. Um, but I think what we're also getting is, is those individuals, like myself actually, who very much, I've always valued education, but I think I've always put experience before that um, and I've always, I've always kind of valued that ahead of, ahead of the kind of the qualifications that you put behind it. And I think what that's actually enabled us to do is to kind of employ people who are fantastically um, academically capable, um, but actually really value that experience. So when you kind of couple them together, it, it's actually developed a, a really fantastic kind of talent pipeline. Yeah, and to, to echo what Sarah's just said, I mean, our degree apprentices coming in at a young age, you know, they have all stated that they were attracted because of the vocational nature of the, of the course with the role. They wanted the dynamic piece of experiencing life within a busy supply chain and logistics business, which they are getting, and also getting that degree. So it's a mixture of... Um, the two really attractive elements that they, that they wanted and what we're also seeing in historically supply chain logistics has been a very sort of male orientated area of industry but now our percentage of young ladies 
you know, taking leadership degrees in supply chain and logistics is well above the national average. Uh, you know, and it's really encouraging to see that, you know, doing a fantastic job, but also enjoying it, you know, and getting stuck in there and, and getting in some really engaging products and projects and things like that coming out of it. Um, and, you know, it, it, yeah, all I can say is we need it to continue because uh, it, it's a key focus area for DHL as a company, as it is for many other companies. And this is sort of proof that, you know, if you get the right people at the right age, uh, the non-traditional route, which probably has not been followed before, is actually quite attractive for these people yeah. and they do enjoy it. If I can just add on that, I think we've got a two-pronged approach, um, similar to what you said, you know, for some of our new degree level apprenticeships, they are designed in areas where we've got critical shortages. So to attract new talent into the NHS, I mean, it's a no-brainer. You're going to get a job, you're going to get your degree funded, you're not going to get yourself into debt. But also, for a lot of our existing workforce that would never have had the opportunity to do a degree where they would have had to give up work and they can't afford to lose their income, we've got some fantastic case studies of where they're progressing into degree levels. You know, they've been with an organisation potentially 20 years as a healthcare assistant can now progress onto registered nurse and the degree apprenticeship has given them that opportunity. Yeah. yeah, I totally agree again with the existing employee piece. We've got quite a number of individuals who probably never thought they would be doing a degree mm. and now in the middle of a degree and you know their career progression is reignited and you know they're finding out what they really are capable of after maybe having a break or or not you know realising what they wanted to do within the career. Um, so it's a fantastic opportunity. And can I just bring you in on, um, Pearson have done a lot of work on diversity and I think you've been involved in quite a range of projects yourself. Um, what's worked well and, and what more could other organisations be doing around organisations, do you think? Okay. Um, firstly, let me just sort of follow up what my colleagues have said. Um, I think the, the opportunity that degree apprenticeships have given has really helped in terms of diversity as well and accessibility to learning. So, I mean, we have two grandmothers that are just coming to the end of the uh, Charter Management degree apprenticeship. Um, and it's just an amazing achievement. I mean, one's a single mum with four kids. And how she's done it, I do not know, but, you know, all credit to her. Um, so we've got the diversity that it provides and the mobility it provides within the business. But we historically have, have not really recruited young people into our business. Um, and we've also been looking at quite high academic levels because of some of the roles that we have. So we have really worked hard to um, start to position ourselves as an employer of choice for younger people um, around the country, but I suppose predominantly at the moment in London. Um, so I work with a number of charities, um, Children's Society, because I think, you know, care leavers really are not getting the opportunities to get into apprenticeships. So we work with them. We um, do some work with another charity called Leadership Through Sport and Business that are um, operating in London, Birmingham, Manchester. And we actually did an insight day with some of their um, young students last week who are aspiring to become apprentices. And it was a phenomenal day. It, it really was a lovely, lovely day. And at the end of it, they all said they wanted to come and join us. So I thought, yeah, that, that's a winner. That really is. Um, but I think the, the key thing is that it's part of what we see as our corporate social responsibility to be able to go out and promote apprenticeships so that other organisations can see the benefit of them. Um, and also the diversity of of attracting different candidates, different people, and giving um, young people and other groups of people the opportunity to aspire to come to a big FTSE 100 company, and probably they'd never thought that they could do that. So I think that's about that opening of the door, and you know, it's about having a certain amount of resource to be able to go out there and promote yourself as an organisation. There's lots of career fairs, so it's about choosing the ones that are most appropriate. We do a little bit of work with schools, but there's only myself and one colleague, so we spread ourselves very thinly. But it is about that, that acknowledgement. And as a levy paying employer, I can also now share the levy with other businesses. So again, we've taken the same approach. So we're wanting to work with businesses in our supply chain, because there's obviously a benefit to the business and the future of the sector, but also smaller organisations and in sectors where it's really difficult for them to actually engage with young people or very difficult in terms of paying for the training that an apprenticeship would need. So that transfer of funds is really opening up that opportunity 
to diversify our impact, not directly in terms of our own workforce, but our impact on other organisations' workforces. And can I just um, pick up on that? How are you supporting, say, the supply chain then? So, you know, what are you doing with them to to get yeah, apprenticeships I mean, off the ground? I think in one sense it could be just seen as a transactional relationship. You know, you pass over money, great. We don't, we're not doing that at all. We want to work in partnership with that organisation and their provider and ensure that they're entering into apprenticeships with the, the right mentality to maximise the benefit to their business and to the individual apprentices. So we put a lot of support in. We help them with the apprenticeship system, which can be a, yeah, it can phase anybody, I have to say. Um, we're also going to put together some employer forums where we bring them together twice a year and really have agendas that are relevant to them. That seems to have gone down exceptionally well, I have to say, with the um, organisations I've been speaking to. And it's just that, that gentle, I suppose it's them knowing that they've got somebody they can turn to and ask a question, regardless of how silly they might think it is, and know they're going to get a reasonably sensible, realistic answer. Because it's not always easy to get that from, say, the Education Skills Funding Agency or others. They're there, but it takes a bit of time and you have to go through the process. So I think that relationship is absolutely vitally important. And it's going to be good for us as well, because there's definitely going to be a knock-on benefit, I'm sure. Yeah, just to pick up on that, so HEE, we have a levy transfer matchmaking service, because again, obviously we're working with large levy paying trusts, but we've also got GP practices, pharmacies, care homes, so if we can actually utilise that and share the levy and make sure that we can get apprenticeships in these smaller organisations, then that's only going to, in turn, kind of potentially reduce the burden on A&E and things like that, so if you're looking at the bigger picture, being able to utilise the levy transfer process is a really good thing. And Kate, can I just ask you how, how what's diversity looking like? You know, what, what's apprenticeships um, doing for diversity in your organisation? Yeah, so so we've got um, we're, we're part of the civil service, Public Health England. We're we're an arm's length body or an executive agency of the Department of Health and Social Care, um, and so we have quite rigid, uh, for want of a better word, recruitment rules that we have to follow. Um, but we've got a couple of, um, it, it's a system that's called an exception. Um, and the people that write the rules around recruitment have given specific exceptions to people from disadvantaged backgrounds. So we work with um, care leavers as well. We actually, uh, we work with Bernardo's in particular, um, who are also a provider. So when they deliver an apprenticeship for us with somebody who's come from the care um, leaver system, they get that ongoing support through Bernardo's. Mm -hmm. Um, but we also work with um, ex-offenders as well. There's a scheme called Going Forward into Employment. Um, so we can take people that are prison leavers or you know, due to leave prison fairly shortly and offer them um, apprenticeships within PHE. And they don't have to, they're already classed as being at a disadvantage from somebody else applying for the role. So they don't have to go through that formal application process, et cetera, et cetera. And the way we tend to, to sort of interview them, if you like, is around success profiles. So it's more about their, their emotional intelligence rather than what qualifications they've got. Or, you know, it's about what skills they can bring, their transferable skills from what they may have done previously or life experiences. Um, and I mean, we're also um, encouraging more women in STEM is another sort of big thing. We can't discriminate with our employment we can't say you know, men need not apply women only please but you know we do have certain ways that we can we can encourage you know women to apply for some of the stem roles that we've got within phe so we're, we're seeing that actually these individuals are bringing massive life experiences in and colleagues are really learning from these individuals you know things that they may not have experienced and of course it's hitting our social mobility agenda too so yeah so, Vera, I'll come back to you. You, yeah. you. you kind of mentioned this earlier. So, yeah. you know, why is it so important? Why is this diversity so important for the workforce? And how are your programmes at the OU helping sure. with it? So, I think it's, it's hugely important. I think um, there are some distinct advantages, commercial benefits to, to having a diverse and inclusive workforce. I think there's lots of well documented research out there that says that if you have a gender diverse workforce, you're increasing profits by about 21%. And that increases to about 31% or 33% if you have a culturally diverse workforce. So it's all part of that social mobility and they're all about 
you know, creating value for your organisation, and also speeds up decision making and speeds up thinking. So I think that's the key message that's coming out of the research. Um, an interesting point I picked up as well from the research I've seen is that um, it's a top priority for millennials. So they're seeing this as their number one aspect. Having a diverse workforce is something that they, they're attracted to organisations for. So I think it's a real key aspect of what we do. Um, as for the OU, how can we help? Well, our mission is to be open and accessible to everybody. So all our pro undergraduate programmes do not have any entry requirements in them. So for us, that opens up the market and that opens up gender diversity and cultural diversity within organisations that we work with. So I think that, that's a key thing, I think. So anyone who wants to study at the OU can do, regardless of their background, regardless of their age, regardless of any cultural differences they have. And that's what's unique about the OU, and that's how we help with that, div that diversity within the workforce and working with employers that can, that, that, that's really embrace that and want to make that uh, happen in their organisations. That's great, thank you. So we come to our final topic of conversation for this webinar, which is demonstrating the value of apprenticeship programmes. So we're nearly three years into the levy in England, and we know the government aims to help employers invest in skills um, and improve the workings of the levy. That's what it would like to see. Uh, we also know that the Scottish Government and Welsh Government are keen to evaluate the successes. So we've heard lots of interesting insights and just ideas and experiences of how um, apprenticeships are positively impacting individuals and the business. So how the question for this um, last topic of conversation is how could employers better capture this impact and share them more widely? So that's an open question to you all, so who would like to go first? Uh, Dave? I think for me, uh, it's, it's a big step change and sharing it with Wales and Scotland, it's just understanding that we move, we've moved from frameworks to standards and the framework system was very, pretty prescriptive. You sent an individual for training and that was given. I think what I've experienced is, is getting people to understand this is an employer levy and the employer needs to play a positive part in making it work. And, and I did mention it earlier about being involved in creating the curriculums. It's not just about pulling these new standards off the shelf and expecting them to do the work. You've got to put the time in, you've got to work with the training provider, and you've got to deliver the knowledge, skills, and behaviors that are required within your business. And it's about understanding what you want from that program. We were talking earlier about the output. You know, What do you want this person to be? and how are you going to get them there? And if you get that as a plan up front, because that has been quite challenging, moving from frameworks to standards, and I think passing that process on and helping them be involved in developing something like that may take away a bit of the pain that um, they may experience um, going along the pathway that we've been along. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, at HEE, we've been involved in the development of over 70 child blazers, health-specific ones, for that very reason that we had our employers saying, but we can't <coughs> utilise our levy, we haven't got these standards. So, you know, now we have got this wide raft available. I think last year we were utilising 86 different frameworks and standards across the NHS, plans to top that over to 100 this year. So it's all moving in the right direction, for sure. I think the, um, the, the nice thing about um, the standards is that you can actually work with a provider and you can bespoke them to what your organisation needs. So we've done that in PHE. We've looked at one of the leadership management um, standards. And so long as you um, can demonstrate within that learning the, the knowledge, the skills and the behaviours are there. Um, and throughout the learning, uh, all of that is gained through the learning. Um, you know, we, we've looked at bespoking uh, a leadership management uh, approved standard into what we need our leaders and managers or our leaders in particular within the civil service or within PHE, what we need them to look like. Um, so we're able to kind of like pull in and work with providers to actually make that what, what we need so we can utilise it more. I mean, um, as Lucy said, I mean, we, we've also trailblazed um, doing two or three, I think now, uh, across public health because you know defining the occupation was quite difficult um because when you've got the nhs and then you've got public health public health is always a um, bit of a sort of little sister almost to the nhs so it's what is public health um but we we have developed a, a degree level um standard in public health which means we can use that more um but it's quite difficult to to create a standard that is purely for one occupation 
it's very very difficult so you have to kind of think who else works in public health and we have got local authorities there are people that work in public health even with, within the, the NHS so you know we were able to do that but um, but yes so the st standards I think have made a, a huge difference. Mm. I mean I, I would say data is going to be a big one as well and we've got the um, National Apprenticeship Network which is starting to pull together some regional data so there'll be some national pulling of that um, to demonstrate some of the successes but I think as, as organisations we need to be a lot more public about the impact from our apprentices as well and again where we've got data to use that data we've got the new um, IIP quality mark coming in this year um, I think that's going to be a really useful tool to actually get some of this messaging more higher profile within the business, but also externally as well. So I think if we're able to demonstrate the impact as employers from what we've done with the levy and the standards, then that will help um, in terms of the devolved government work. Yeah, just picking up on one of your points there as well, though, in terms of, you know, I've been in this role for nearly four years now and I'm no longer getting what I want them to do a proper degree. I want them to do the <laughs> traditional route. Actually, people are really yeah. seeing that mm -hmm. um, parity and actually, you know, it's, it's a game changer in terms of, well, actually, why would I do the traditional route? Why would I pay for my degree, take out £27,000 worth of loan? You know, and I think, you know, the sooner we get that now, in terms of younger people, we are getting lots more inquiries. Apparently last year, nursing was the most requested apprenticeship via the National Apprenticeship Service, which is really positive. And I think one of the things which are influencing that are actually looking at the outputs from the young individuals doing the degrees and also the existing employees doing the degrees. You know, people are seeing quality coming through. And, you know, so we can actually use this, this, these results to get some traction. And we're no longer saying it might be, it could be. We can say now it is, you know, and that's making a big difference. Okay. Lucy, can I just come back to, you know, you said it's taken four years for that shift. So what are the types of things you've been doing to help make that shift so that people see that value? Um... To be fair, we haven't really changed our messaging. I just think every messaging has its moment in terms of actually um, just those conversations. But yeah, we go out to trust, we do events, we do lots of kind of myth busting. I think there's still a huge amount of myths and misunderstandings around apprenticeships and what you can and can't do. So it's just making sure that we're regularly making sure that the message is there, um, utilising our case studies. Um, you know, we talked about your great example. We've got a mum of seven who has um, completed her level uh, three healthcare apprenticeship. She's now on her level four five nurse and associate plans to become a registered nurse and when you share stories inspiring stories like that then you know people do actually listen I think this could be me or actually go back to their organization and say why are we not offering this opportunity to our staff so it's just making sure that you know we've got the right messaging out there as I said still lots of misunderstandings and myths out there which is quite disappointing when we are kind of three four years into this but um you know divide and conquer we will get there <laughs> so uh Another question on this theme, so is it, how have you sold in apprenticeships with your organisation? So, so how, you know, and, and if you were to give that advice to others, what, what is it that you're d doing or have done that's really given the value to these programmes so that you can sell it in? I think the key for us is, is engaging with the existing population of leaders um, who have maybe been you know, incumbent in their roles for quite some time and just getting their buy-in, so running webinars, um, you know, educating these people, talking to them, inviting them to sessions uh, where they can ask as many questions, you know. Like we said, there are lots of myths still around about apprenticeships, but there were a lot more, and we've dispelled these myths by sort of inviting these individuals to events like this, or, you know, less informal events where we can, you know, Q&As, just, you know, tell us what questions, what concerns, what worries you've got. You know, what, what do you think apprentices are? And, you know, just have that open and honest discussion. And you, we're now seeing some of these leaders who have got apprentices in, in our business are at some of our best advocates. Because, you know, we, what you've not got to remember is for nigh on 80% of the time, these leaders are the glue that will hold this programme together. You know, they are the vocational leads where the apprentices are putting their theoretical learning into practice. So it's really important that they're engaged and we are now seeing, you know, we are seeing some of these leaders now, probably because they've been involved and have got a new um, view on apprenticeships, they're now taking higher level apprenticeships themselves to move up from what would be a, an FLM to an ops manager doing a level five apprenticeship, you know, and reaping the benefits. 
So it's going back to these young people passing on that really positive intrinsic message, but actually seeing the output and, you know, some individuals saying, I want to be part of that. And is that educating the leadership level um, an issue for other organisations on the panel? Has that been a... Yeah, I mean, I would say, that, I mean, that's where we absolutely started, was the mm -hmm. absolute senior exec team in the UK. That's where I positioned the apprentices and got their buy-in. And what they've become, as you were saying, Dave, is, is the champions, the ambassadors. They are there supporting. I can call upon them if I need to, to push something through or get their, their view. They also all mentor some of our senior leader apprentices as well, some on the CMDA and some of the senior leaders. Um, but then I would also say it's constant communication. You know, it's that constant sharing of information, case studies, positive uh, role, role models. It's all of that that goes on. And that is a continual thing because businesses change, people change, roles change. So we are always communicating out to the business about what we're doing, the impact of what we're doing. And it's aligning it to the business objective as well. It wouldn't have a place in our business if it didn't actually answer some of our business needs. So it's really up there. I think out of the five real key business objectives, we're hitting three. Um, so that really does give us, you know, centre stage in terms of people development, which is, you know, makes my life a bit easier. <laughs> I think I think Martin as well. Um, you know, embedding apprenticeships as a KPI within your organisation is a real key factor in this because that that gets a buy-in from all levels, all the way from top all the way down to the bottom. I think that, and as, as and you've mentioned, is that if you're ticking some of your business objectives. That's a win-win for everyone, right? Because you're going to do this as part of a, as a line manager. So, you know, we've had instances where it's come from the top and the line manager's gone, well, actually, I don't think that works for me. Mm. But actually, if it's embedded within the KPI process and, and, and hitting their objectives and actually helping them do their job better, then, you know, it works. So there is a bit of work to be done in that, that space, I think. But it's got to be all the way through the organisation. And, you know, apprenticeships by design, I think, is, is the kind of word I'll be yeah. using quite a lot. Yeah, I mean, Kate and I, you know, as public sector, we've got that public sector target. Yeah. So, you know, having that 2.3% yeah. there, yeah, in, you know, and exactly. And it, but it also encourages conversation when you hear about the challenges. If you can go to one trust and say, but, you know, they've done 4.5%, <laughs> why are you on this? You know, yeah. but again, it's sharing that best practice, yeah. busting the myths and just making sure that, that, that they can understand yeah. it is possible. Yeah, I, absolutely right, Lucy. And <clears throat> um, I think probably since the levy came in, probably 2017 and 2018, I almost had to say, can we just not talk about the target? Because there isn't, and, and people would say, but there's nothing for us, there's nothing for us, there's nothing in science, there's nothing here, there's nothing there. And as more degree and more master's level apprenticeships have come through, where we've already got people in order to be able to do their role, have to have a specific degree in a scientific field, um, they can now go on and do a master's in that field. Um, so this year, I might get my target but I know I haven't hit it for the last two years because there hasn't necessarily been that much there. But then the work that I've had to do is go out across the whole of the business and map all of our different professions that we've got and then look at the National Apprenticeship Service website and find all of those apprenticeship standards that can actually cover off all of these different bits of learning. So it's been a journey. It's been a real journey. Um, but I, and, I, and I think having, you know, having KPIs is great. But I've actually had to say to my senior leaders, OK, yes, we've got a target. And they'll say, Kate, why are we not hitting the target? And I'll say, because it's not necessarily the right thing to do for the business. Yeah. Hmm. Um, and if it's not the right thing to yeah. do for the business, we can't do it. Yeah. Yeah. Also, right? depending yeah. on the size of the organisation, we've yeah. still got some where they're achieving their public sector target, mm. still not spending all their levy. Yeah. So, you know, you have to just measure up to make sure what's uh, good for the business yeah. and that the quality is maintained, because that's always the danger as well with, K with KPIs, yeah. sure. that the quality could potentially dip. Definitely. I think that back to Viren's point, actually, about kind of embedding apprenticeships throughout the organisation, I think the, the kind of the new structure of the standards and the fact that more employers are kind of playing around with existing employees doing apprenticeships as well, actually, it's kind of, I think I would say that we probably sort of started with a sort of top down approach in the sense of going to the senior leaders and kind of securing their buy into the programmes, sharing amazing case studies with them, um, kind of from the bottom up in terms of actually speaking to the apprentices, getting them to share their case studies, talk about how they love being apprentices. But now that we're playing in the this kind of existing employee space, actually we're kind of touching the organisation at all levels, which I think is where, where we and most other employers are starting to see the impact on a much bigger scale. Um, which is which I think is fantastic.
Yeah, I think at all, we, we, what, we, what we've not, not got to forget is it's allowed us to showcase roles within DHL which you would probably not necessarily think that we needed. So we've got apprentices doing robotics, we've got apprentices doing auto repair, you know, we've got apprentices doing digital design. And you, when you talk to people and say, you know, DHL logistics company, being able to showcase roles in those areas in this, you know, the 21st century and the digital age, it's like, wow, we didn't, you know, it really is very impactful. Yeah. And skills of the future. Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. So, Anne, can I just quickly come back to you? Because I, I, so we, but there's a lot of power in the sort of the personal testimony, isn't there? Mm -hmm. I mean, you've all shared that, the, the energy, the, the, re, the experience that apprentices are having, that clearly really communicates value. Um, but then there's this mix of data that you're talking about. So that sounds like that's coming on stream more and more. Yeah, I mean, we... What we started to do as a team is actually um, present our data in different ways. So we present the data for the senior leaders, so that goes up from a financial perspective, but also in terms of uh, learner experience, return on investment. But we also produce data for our apprentices and line managers, so that they can see the impact. They hear about it through case studies, but they actually can see the physical tangible impact in data as well um, and then also that forms part of our um, public promotion of apprenticeships you know we do a huge amount on social media and with our partners around um, you know the case studies the examples the testimonials and then we can back it up by saying this person represents 97 percent they've got distinctions that is always great and of course, the, the, uh, the additional benefit is our providers have data for an Ofsted inspection, should they have one, or for a, an Office of Students um, audit. Mm. So we are, as the employer, helping them with their evidence base, which I feel passionate about. You know, we are an extension to them when it comes to their inspection, and I do not want to let them down. Thank you. So we've come to the end of our four topics of discussion and we've got a, just a few minutes for um, Q&A so it's over to our audience at this point so if, if anyone's got a question could you just put your hand up and we do have a question already um, if you'd just like to say your name and the organisation you represent yes, my name's Alison Barlow and I work for DXE Technology um, this is actually a question one of my colleagues asked me to bring to the forum so um, he, he asked, he said, I recently read an article which stated that more focus might be put on the more traditional apprenticeships, level three to five, as opposed to the bachelor stroke master degree apprenticeships. Um, he thinks that this was just speculations, a lot of time money has been invested in the higher level apprenticeships, but it would be good to see um, what the panel, whether the panel has any insight and OU as well uh, into this, and if we uh, will still have the opportunity to offer our staff degree courses. So I think it's just about exploring further. I think it ties in with the mindset switch from traditional to degree apprenticeships. Thank you. Um, if I could answer that, yeah, it is a concern to us. We've heard rumblings as well in terms of the levy being overcommitted and there might be potentially restrictions on what you can and can't fund. But from our perspective, we have developed all these new degree level apprenticeships for roles where we know we've got critical shortages. So it would be very disappointing not to be able to spend our levy on developing our future workforce as we need to. I mean, we know that the Conservative Party in their manifesto have uh, committed to sort of helping employees invest in skills and obviously improving the, work, the working of the levy. So I think that the mood music from, from government is that, you know, they are looking at that, they're changing it. It has created, I suppose, speculation within the sector of, over, you know, promoting, over-promoted certain levels over others. But I think that what we're hearing from, from government is actually, you know, we, what we're saying to government, sorry, is that, you know, it should be employer-led. The employer knows best what their, where their skills gaps are, and that's the key message that we're landing with government. And that's the key message that you know we all should be saying to government is, look, it's my organisation. I know where my skills gap are, gaps are. It may be at the lower levels. It could be at the higher levels. And I need to fill them for what I need as an organisation. So I think that's the kind of message. And I think you know, I suppose the research or the the articles from CBI are quite reassuring for me that that's exactly what business is saying on a wider wider landscape so I think yes there are noises I think you know I'm fairly comfortable that the government is going to move in direction the, the levy does need tweaks we do we do want tweaks not wholesale change I think that's a key message mm. that I'd, I'd like to get out there yeah I, I, I would agree with you um, Vera and I think 
when, when you think about careers and career pathways, if you bring somebody in and you can only offer them apprenticeships at a lower level, but you want to retain them within your organisation, you're not going to be able to retain them if you can't offer them something at a higher level. So they're going to leave your organisation, they're going to go to university, and all, everything that goes with that. Um, so, you know, to, to, to kind of move, getting rid of degree and master's level apprenticeships, I think is like, you know, slightly mad, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I'm being brutally honest, because you, you're not going to be able to keep your, your staff. Yeah. And then, you know, when they do that degree, um, they're out of the workplace for three, four, five years, however long it takes them to do it, and they're not necessarily going to come back into the workforce either. So, yeah. I mean, from my experience, it's two things. Um, there's still quite a number of trailblazer groups going on at level six and level seven, um, and I'm actively involved in some of them. Um, and then also, I've, I've just filled in a survey for the CMI around this very topic in terms of impact and benefit of the CMDA and the SLMDA. So, you know, there's a lot of um, voices out there saying that these have got value. Uh, and actually, I think they would dilute the apprenticeship brand that we've all worked really, really hard to create once the levies come in and as we've all heard it's, it's in a different place to where it was and I think if you take level six and seven out you're going to do some serious damage to it. Yeah and, and I totally agree I think the work gone into developing the, the, the degree standards what we've now got and now seeing the value add that we are seeing uh, will totally undermine uh, the apprenticeship area you know and I think all companies and industries who are engaging in the degree level apprenticeships will be positively lobbying the government uh, to keep it as it is because we are seeing value add and like I said earlier we are engaging with a, a pool of young individuals who are, give, who are taking that middle route that middle path um, and it's adding some real benefits it's a win-win you know it's a win-win for for companies and it's a win-win for the individuals so I, I would um, be definitely for keeping it as it is <laughs> Great, thank you. Hi, Jackie Hinton, Director of Apprenticeships at the OU. Um, it's sort of talking about that impact and retention of staff. Some employers we talk to say that they're getting much better uh, retention on uh, degree apprenticeships than they were on their old graduate schemes. And I just wondered if anybody else has, has found that you know, similar experience. From a point of view of the degree apprenticeships, we, we've sort of, we're going into our third year of, of starting another cohort up this year, so we've not got the actual figures of people finishing programmes yet, but what we, the, the discussions we are having and the development we're seeing and the value add that we're seeing is clearly indicating that these individuals want to be with DHL and want to progress their careers. And I think that's because the programmes they're on give them visibility of where they're going to be going and what they can be doing. And they can start mapping their career and, and sort of actually picturing where they're going to be taken um, at a very early stage. And, you know, it's about getting that qualification. It's about getting that experience. But it's also about getting the right package, you know, for these individuals. And I think if you get that together, you know, that will really help and have a positive effect on your retention. Um, yeah. Yeah, just on that, I mean, it's early days, but we're getting anecdotal evidence so far that certainly in terms of the degree apprenticeship, the attrition rate is much lower than your traditional route. Um, is that because they're actually going and putting those skills into the workplace straight away? They're getting exposed to busy wards and the realities of what working in the NHS is going to be like, whereas in the traditional route, you're in the classroom, you're learning a lot of the theory. Um, and so sometimes when you actually do get into that environment, it can be a bit daunting and a bit of a shock. So yeah, anecdotally, um, we are going to be definitely measuring it more um, clearly, but we are certainly hearing from training providers, universities and employers that the attrition rate is lower for the degree apprenticeships. Okay, Liz Hemway, Senior Corporate Development Manager at the Open University. So the theme of Apprenticeship Week has been look beyond. So if we were to invite you back in three years time to be doing a, a discussion again, in an ideal world, where, where would you like to see things and any changes um, in the apprenticeship space? that one and um, so I think I think I'd like to see structurally that uh, the kind of way that apprenticeships are set up the levy um, I think we have the foundations of something that's really fantastic and something that's actually a really sustainable model um, but it's not quite right it's not quite there yet um, I think the levy gets a lot of knocking um, and I, I do think it has a lot of potential but I'd like to see government kind of working on on a model that actually makes it 
makes it as sustainable as it has the, the the kind of opportunity to be really in terms of kind of giving access to those SMEs to kind of be able to upskill their workforce but also not penalising large organisations at the same time um, with that so I think I'd, li I'd definitely like to see structurally for it to be in a, in a kind of stronger more sustainable um, model um, and I think from a personal perspective I'd just like to see a lot more apprentices um, less stigma attached to it um, and I think we're definitely heading in the right direction to, to see to see us achieve that yeah I'd agree with that I think for me it's just around parity you know I'd like to be in three years time apprentice saying to us I couldn't get on a university I uh, couldn't get a degree apprenticeship so I'm having to do a traditional university course I think that would be amazing <laughs> I think in three years time I'd like to have one of our degree apprentices sat at the side of me uh, <laughs> telling their story uh, and giving some real sort of uh, facts behind the journey and, and how it's benefited them but also I'd like to see the government infrastructure as mentioned earlier there to support the growth in the apprenticeships what we really need you know in all levels you know we've got quite a lot of standards there uh, on the apprenticeship website and I know there's lots of work going through trying to identify the duplication and, and any crossovers so in three years time I'd like to see that done and I'd like to see it, you know, really identifiable as to what you need and what areas you need to go in and, and an expansion in the degree level area. Because I think as businesses, we've, we've started on the road with the Chartered Degree Apprenticeship, but there's lots more degree level apprenticeships, which I think are now taking off and getting traction, which I think businesses do require and will require to move forward. I would like to see um, schools career guidance advisors talking about apprenticeships first um, and for it to be just a natural part of conversation from year nine and probably even younger actually all the way through um, so that that would be an ideal uh, it's, it's getting there but but not there I think also it, it would be great in three years time that we see a closer alignment between apprenticeships and new T levels that are coming out traineeships they're all disparate they're not joining up um, so that needs to actually be sorted out. And that might mean a change to the levy, so that as employers, we can have more of a financial say on T-levels and traineeships. Who knows? But it needs to all be aligned, and it's not at the moment. Yeah, um, for me, I would like them to relax the targets imposed on <laughs> civil servants, <laughs> um, which are, are, are pretty difficult. Um, again, um, the levy as well. I mean, it, it's we, we can't spend it. Um, and yes, it goes to SMEs, but you know, how much more can we be doing as as organisations? I mean, we're very similar to, to Pearson as that we're looking into at the moment using some of our transfers, which which has actually been a benefit. Actually, this year I think it's gone up. It was like ten percent, now it's like twenty five percent or something. So that's going in the right direction. We should be able to transfer more of our levies to other organisations um, in our supply chain, or the you know kind of help us. You know, build our organisations and build our businesses. Yeah. I think for me, I think I'd like to see in three years' time more, a more flexible approach to apprenticeships and not only in the operation, how it operates, but also what you can use it for, actually. So, you know, having a standard is great and you're having people go down a, a pathway, but actually there's a wider holistic approach to education or skills development, which is needed. So, I, I, you know, my, my career, I started off as an accountant and now I'm in the commercial world. So it doesn't mean that because I did an accounting qualification, I cannot go into the commercial world. We need rounded, rounded individuals in business. We need rounded individuals to drive our economy. The, I th I'd love to see the yeah, levy to be able to help enable that in some way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. would be great. Great. Well, I think that brings us to the end of today's webinar. So thank you ever so much to our fantastic panel and for all your insights and sharing your experiences. And thank you to our audience and for your questions too. Um, if you have any further questions, um, then do please email them to us um, at business at open.ac.uk. Thank you very much.